Yet another critical issue under the rug. Senator Grogan, it being 2 p.m., we are required to move to questions without notice. Uh, Leader of the House. Oh, thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, I seek leave to make a brief statement regarding a ministerial absence. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I thank the Senate. I advise the Senate that Senator Rustin will be absent from question time today for personal reasons. In Senator Rustin's absence, I will represent the Minister for Families and Social Services, the Minister for Indigenous Australians and the Minister for Housing. Senator Mackenzie will represent the Minister for Resources and Water, and Senator Payne will represent the Minister for Women's Safety. Senator Wong, are you seeking the call? Uh, seek leave to make a short statement. There being no objection, leave yes, is granted. We, we appreciate, uh, appreciate that there must be circumstances which have given rise to a very short period of notice, but I just would like to again reiterate it is important for question time that such notice is given uh, as soon as practicable of ministerial absences. Thank you, Senator Wong. We will go now to questions. Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. In a report released this month, Mr Morrison's hand-picked quarantine adviser, Ms Jane Halton, told him, and I quote, some quarantine settings, such as quarantine in a purpose-built facility, are better able to mitigate transmission risks, especially for high-risk travellers and in respect of variants of concern. Almost two years into the pandemic and with a new variant of concern on our shores, why has Mr Morrison failed to establish even one new federal quarantine facility? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks. Um, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator McCarthy for her question, uh, a similar question to the one in which she asked yesterday. And uh, that question yesterday, as I outlined to the Senate, Mr President, uh, we do recognise uh, that there is uh, an ongoing role in the future for uh, there to be centres of national resilience of, uh, of greater number and scale than, uh, than we have had in the past. Through the course of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we have has successfully worked in partnership with the Northern Territory Government, who I acknowledge, uh, to utilise the Howard Springs facility uh, and to expand significantly Order. the Howard Springs facility to a 2,000 uh, bed capacity. Mr President, uh, uh, alongside that, uh, we are working uh, with governments in Victoria uh, to ensure the establishment of a new centre for national resilience, uh, that we will see initial handover of beds in, uh, at that facility to the Victorian Government uh, in, uh, by the end of this year um, and, uh, and with the governments of Queensland and Western Australia for further Order, facilities, uh, Mr President. Um, now these will all provide long-term resilience capability. Uh, in terms of the broader quarantine effort, states and territories uh, have uh, done uh, a very strong job in working uh, to ensure uh, that we had quarantine capacities uh, for uh, the most extraordinary of circumstances that COVID-19 have presented. In relation, Mr President, to uh, the Omicron variant, uh, the government has made certain announcements uh, to pause uh, the, uh, the next stage of reopening that we have indicated. And we don't wish to see uh, any step backwards from the safe reopening of Australia. Uh, the very high levels of vaccination that we have achieved as a country do provide very strong protections. Uh, we use this pause to ensure that we can continue, as we always have, get the best possible health advice uh, to continue to keep Australians safe. Senator McCarthy, a supplementary question. Chief Executive of the Business Council of Australia, Jennifer Westacott, said this morning, and I quote, why can't we get the systems in place to manage this? There are 24 letters in the Greek alphabet. Everyone assumes that we're going to have more mutations and variants, end of quote. Why has the Morrison government refused to take responsibility for national quarantine? Minister. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, well, as I outlined in the primary, uh, primary answer, Mr. President, uh, we are uh, indeed working on a range of additional facilities uh, alongside the expansion we created in Howard Springs. Uh, we are fully funding the development of those different facilities uh, under memoranda of understanding that we have entered into with the relevant uh, states. Uh, those uh, memoranda of understanding uh, have the states uh, operating those facilities uh, consistent with the operational capabilities that they have delivered throughout the COVID-19 pandemic uh, for the purposes uh, of providing quarantine. Uh, I would stress that whilst there are new variants, we 
do need to all show responsibility in terms of how we discuss those new variants. Uh, that, for example, Professor Lewin from the Doherty Institute uh, this morning made clear that it's highly likely the vaccines still work, uh, that, uh, that we're quite confident the vaccines will still work. Uh, and whilst we are pausing some steps to get further advice and information, uh, we ought to make sure we maintain confidence Minister, of Australians. Minister, in this your regard. time has expired. Senator McCarthy, a second supplementary. Mr. President, on what date will a new federal quarantine facility first commence operation? Minister. Thanks, Mr. President. As I said in the primary question, the Howard Springs facility has operated largely throughout and has been significantly expanded, indeed doubled, during the operation of that facility. As I also said in the primary question, Mr. President, the facility being built in Victoria will see handover of the first beds in that facility to the Victorian government before the end of this year. Uh, the Victorian government uh, will then take on the operational capabilities. Uh, I thank them, as I do the governments of Western Australia and Queensland, uh, for the way in which they have engaged with the Commonwealth uh, through the design stages, uh, their officials working with us in terms of all of the different protocols necessary to ensure the highest standards of infection control, uh, the highest standards of protocols of safety in relation to those facilities uh, and the agreements that they have entered into in relation to the Commonwealth responsibility for building and their role in relation for operation. Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the Minister please inform the Senate on the status of the final report on the independent review into Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces titled Set the Standard? Thank you. The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr President. I thank Senator Askew for her question, her interest in this matter, as I know that many senators, uh, many members of the House of Representatives have expressed a serious interest and concern uh, for these matters. Can, on behalf of all of us, welcome the report of the Independent Review of Commonwealth Parliamentary Workplaces, uh, led by the Sex Discrimination Commissioner, Kate Jenkins, Thank her for her leadership in this review and for the report set the standard. This report highlights that people who work in our parliament and the agencies that exist across its operation consider it a privilege to be here and work with the utmost of integrity, making a difference to our nation in the vast majority of cases. We should give thanks and celebrate the work of all of those tireless individuals right across this building and across parliamentary workplaces. However, the report also highlights that people, particularly women, in our workplaces have experienced bullying, sexual harassment and sexual assault. It is, Mr President, unacceptable. Some of the examples in this report are deeply distressing. And it is clear that we have not had pathways to successfully prevent uh, these instances from occurring, nor to effectively respond and support people when they have experienced it. Every single Australian has a right to feel and to be safe at work. The high-pressure environment of this workplace is not an excuse for unacceptable behaviour. We should, as the report's title says, set the standard. The report provides 28 practical recommendations for change, which we have a responsibility to make and to work positively through. I thank all of those who have engaged courageously in this review, sharing their stories and helping to drive change and a better workplace for all. I acknowledge this report will be distressing for many as well. Uh, and for those in this building and beyond it who may be distressed by aspects of it, its release, I urge them to access the support services available, be they 1800 APHSPT, uh, 1800 RESPECT uh, or the other services available. Senator Askew, a supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister advise what steps have already been taken to improve the safety and workplace culture of Commonwealth parliamentary workplaces ahead of the government receiving this report? Mm. Minister. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, whilst this important review was underway throughout uh, much of this year, uh, the Prime Minister also commissioned Deputy Secretary in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet Stephanie Foster uh, to review procedures and processes involved in identifying, reporting and responding to serious incidents that occur in the parliamentary workplace. In March, the government accepted an urgent recommendation from Ms Foster to establish an independent trauma-informed confidential support line 1800 APHSPT. Uh, this has been supporting staff and MPs, their family and friends, to receive necessary support. Ms Foster provided her consultation report in June of 2021, 
Following feedback from across the parliament, uh, Ms Foster provided a final report in July of 2021. The government accepted the 10 recommendations in that report, working to establish the Safe and Respectful Workplaces Training Program, uh, the Parliamentary Workplace Support Service uh, and transparency measures and monitoring measures in this regard. I thank Ms Foster for her work, in addition to that of Commissioner Jenkins and all those who have engaged in these processes, including across Minister. the parliament. Senator Askew, a second supplementary. Thank you, Mr President. How does the government propose to consult with all parties and parliamentarians on the recommendations and implementation of the report? Minister. Mr President, uh, the review was established uh, with uh, engagement uh, with the opposition, the Greens, other minor parties, crossbenchers, current and former staff. Uh, we engaged in terms of the reviewer, the terms of reference, the timing and worked collaboratively to ensure a review was put in place that could provide maximum confidence for individuals to participate and to make sure that participation gave us the best possible basis upon which to prevent bullying, sexual harassment or sexual assault in the future. I thank the opposition and all other parties for their engagement to date and commit that we wish to continue the cooperation in relation to the response to this report. The Prime Minister has asked me and the Special Minister of State to consult with all on the way forward to respond. Our desire is to work in a positive way to implement recommendations in this review to affect the type of change that can ensure our parliamentary workplaces do set the standard for safety, for culture, for respect. Minister. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. As the Omicron variant emerges in Australia, a webinar promoted by One Nation was recently hosted by the so-called COVID Medical Network which is under investigation by the TGA for promoting hydroxychloroquine. Why did four government members, LNP MP George Christensen and Senators Canavan, Rennick and Antic, appear on this anti-vaccination, anti-mandate webinar? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr. President. Mr. President, if there is, if there is something uh, that the emergence of the Omicron variant should reinforce to all Australians and to all those around the world, it is the importance of vaccination. It is the importance of encouraging all Australians to be vaccinated. And now, whilst, Mr President, from the outset, our government has always said that vaccination should be voluntary and that we would not enforce mandates except for working with the states and territories in relation to those areas of highly vulnerable individuals such as aged care, disability care uh, and, uh, and those uh, in health practice. We absolutely encourage every single Australian to get vaccinated. And Mr President, I urge every member across this parliament to engage in such encouragement as well. Order. More than 19 million individual Australians have had at least one dose of the vaccine to date. And that is an incredible, incredible turnout by Australians who now account for some of the most highly vaccinated populations in the world. Minister. Minister. Senator Keneally on a point of order. Yes, thank you, Mr President. Direct relevance. Uh, I draw the minister back to the question. What he's, his, his answer here is not relevant to the question. It was very specific. Why did four members of the government appear on this webinar? You have you've brought the minister back to part of the question. You, um, there was an additional statement at the beginning of the question about the Omicron variant. I'm listening carefully to the minister. You've had the chance to bring him back to the question. Minister, you have the call. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, as I said before, I encourage and the government encourages every member of the government, of the crossbench, of the parliament uh, to encourage vaccination and to encourage its take up. Uh, I urge all members uh, to do so. And it is, uh, it is the urging and the health advice from across the country that has helped to achieve 92.4%. Uh, of Australians over the age of 16 to have had at least that first dose. 92.4 per cent of Australians who have heeded that message and who are out there having been vaccinated, Order. getting vaccinated and building those numbers Senator day Keneally. in, day out. We will continue to work oh. to lift those numbers and to grow those numbers as high as Minister, is possible. Minister, 
Your time has expired. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you. A description of the One Nation hosted webinar states, and I quote, the people have been tricked into thinking the vaccines offer the best way to reduce death and hospitalization. Does Mr. Morrison agree with these views? Minister. Mr. President, the quote that was put to me, I outright reject. Mr. Morrison outright rejects it, and the government outright rejects it, Mr. President. Uh, we are very clear Order. that vaccines, vaccines do offer the best possible way for individuals to protect themselves, their loved ones and the communities in which they live and work. That's a message we've delivered consistently to Australians and has driven and achieved Order. one of the highest vaccination rates in the world. Vaccination rate that is above the OECD average, that is above many other nations uh, who have suffered uh, from COVID-19 far more than Australia has to date. Uh, it's our approach that has saved more than 30,000 lives. It's an approach that has delivered this high rate of vaccination. It's an approach that sees us as one of the most protected countries in the Order. world now, having had such high rates of vaccination and being one of the first Minister, to have a nationwide booster Minister, program. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Keneally, a second supplementary Thank question. Thank you. Order. Mr. President, may Order. I ask for— I was calling Senator Canavan to order. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Keneally, you have the call. Will Mr. Morrison order? We'll start the clock again. Senator Keneally, you have the call. Thank you, Mr. President. Will Mr. Morrison counsel Mr. Christensen and Senators Rennick, Antic, and Canavan for spreading dangerous disinformation? as the Omicron variant emerges? Minister. Oh, no, mis, mis, Mr. President, as, as I have just said Order. in this place, I urge all members Order. of the government and all members across the parliament uh, to encourage people to get vaccinated. Mr. Morrison urges all members of the government and all members Order. across the parliament to encourage Australians to continue to get vaccinated. That is what we will each continue to do. It's what the Health Minister will do. It's what Minister Colbeck order. will do. Senator Keneally. Minister, Senator Order. Senator Wong on a point the of order. The point of order is direct relevance. Uh, this question goes to Mr Morrison's actions. And the question, there was only a single question, which is whether he would counsel those members and senators who are active in spreading disinformation, disinformation that's contrary to government policy. That's the question. Where's the bit of leadership? Senator, Senator Wong, I cannot direct the minister how to answer a question. I believe the minister was being directly relevant to the question. Minister, you have the call. Thanks, Mr. President. As I said, Mr. President, we urge all members of the government all members of the parliament to encourage other Australians to get vaccinated. Senator Indeed, Wong. we urge all Australians to encourage Senator one okay. another to get vaccinated. Having achieved such incredibly high rates of vaccination across the country, we are working with states and territories and health officials to Order. particularly target communities of lower vaccination rates, noting the critical importance of having those high rates spread right across the nation. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Waters. Thanks, President. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister. The Human Rights Commission's comprehensive report set the standard is a much needed reality check on the cultural and structural changes needed in this place. We have the bravery of people like Brittany Higgins, Rochelle Miller, Chelsea Potter, Dania Marnie, Saxon Mullins, Grace Tame, Chanel Contos, and strong women in the press gallery to thank for this report existing. I'd also like to thank every single participant who shared their stories and their trauma to create this report. When half the staff who work here have experienced bullying or sexual assault or harassment and only 11 per cent report it, we need action. Can the minister confirm that no staffer or MP in this building will be subject to an experience and a bungled response like Brittany Higgins had to endure? 
Will the government commit to fully implementing all of the recommendations in this landmark report, fully funded and in the time frames Commissioner Jenkins recommends? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. I thank Senator Waters uh, for the question and acknowledge uh, her engagement with me through the course of this year, as, uh, as I acknowledged before, engagement from across this chamber, the other chamber, um, staff, current and former, in relation to the commissioning of this work and also in relation uh, to the actions the government has taken in response to Stephanie Foster's recommendations earlier this year. I think in responding as we did as a parliament uh, to Stephanie Foster's recommendations, we have shown uh, that this parliament and this government recognises the need for action, uh, that these reports, these recommendations and the events of this year need to be a turning point and a driver of change. And the actions we have taken this year in relation uh, to delivering new support services and counselling services, in relation to delivering a new training mechanisms across the parliament and ensuring transparency about MPs and senators take up of those training mechanisms and in relation uh, to establishing uh, the new parliamentary workplace support service to handle complaints and putting in place procedures to ensure uh, that people are held to account for recommendations in response to those complaints all the way through to members of parliament demonstrates a willingness to act. That willingness to act follows through now to the recommendations in the Jenkins report. Uh, we want to see response to these recommendations in the most positive and wholesome way and fulsome way possible. What I would say uh, through you, Mr President, uh, to Senator Waters uh, is that uh, we want to make sure that we continue to engage with you and the opposition and other parties cross benches, staff, current and former, to make sure we get the responses to this right. We have funded responses to date. We have acted to date. We will continue to do that. And I, of course, join you, as I have already publicly and in here, in acknowledging all of those who participated in this review Minister, and drove it to this point. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Thanks, President. Commissioner Jenkins has said that one of the most common themes raised by those who made submissions was the critical role of leaders in creating and maintaining a safe, respectful and inclusive workplace. It comes from the top. When we see the Prime Minister refuse to allow an independent investigation in allegations against a senior minister, refuse to remove a member accused of harassing constituents from committee roles, take aside a female member who dared to cross the floor for a pastoral care chat, what message is that sending from the top? Minister. Mr President, I don't on this day, in receipt of this report, uh, with its recommendations that do require us to work collectively and together to effectively implement them, uh, wish to politicise the report, uh, actions in response to it, in the type of way that Senator Waters' question invites me to do so. Um, as I said before, the events of this year are a catalyst for change. The events of this year have been a catalyst for the type of changes that we have already implemented together as a parliament and for the work that Commissioner Jenkins has undertaken with the engagement of so many staff, current and former, so many members of parliament, current and former. Uh, and I thank indeed those who particularly had interviews uh, with Commissioner Jenkins as part of this process, as I did, uh, in terms of ensuring that all of her thinking and recommendations could be fully informed by how to get the best possible outcomes to set the best possible Minister. standard. Your time has expired. Senator Waters, a second supplementary question. Thanks, President. Another strong theme in the report is that there are rarely any consequences for the abuser if a complaint is made about bullying, sexual harassment or sexual assault. In fact, often they get promoted, while the complainant suffers the consequences, being gaslit, frozen out of work, moved on or encouraged to quit. Will the government commit to introducing a code of conduct for politicians and senior staff that would provide real consequences and act as a genuine deterrent to bad behaviour? Minister. Thanks, Mr President. Uh, I touched in, the, uh, in my primary answer uh, in relation to the question of consequences uh, and the fact that the work we've already done this year ensures that, uh, that we have put in place processes uh, that mean if recommendations through an independent process are made, uh, in response to an allegation of workplace bullying, harassment or the like, uh, that those recommendations need to be acted on and that there are 
transparent and public consequences, including for members of parliament, if that's not the case. Commissioner Jenkins's recommendations build upon that, uh, and we want to work to ensure that we do have those independent and effective processes in place. Commissioner Jenkins's recommendations do also recommend the development uh, of uh, a code of practice in relation to parliamentarians, a code of practice in relation to parliamentary staff, uh, and standards of practice in relation to all work occupants within this workplace. Uh, these are some of the actions that we're committed to working through with other parties uh, to ensure they're delivered upon uh, in the most effective and successful Minister. way possible. Senator Griff. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Minister Payne, representing the Minister for Defence. Minister, the AUKUS uh, security agreement and the government's decision to spend many billions on nuclear submarines is predicated on the rise of China. But there are signs that China will soon peak or may have already done so. Their economy is not what it was. GDP growth is rapidly decelerating, productivity growth has tumbled, and the country is dangerously exposed to a collapsing real estate bubble. The country is ageing rapidly and its birth rate has plummeted. China will almost certainly grow old before it grows rich and may um, pose very little risk to Australia. Given this context, what is the Order. strategic rationale for a long-term investment in nuclear submarines? The minister representing the Minister for Defence, uh, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I thank Senator Griff for his, uh, for his questions. I note the senator's points. However, all of the advice to government, all of the work that we have done with counterparts in the region uh, and indeed more broadly, uh, tells us that our strategic environment has most certainly deteriorated faster than ex anticipated, faster than uh, expected, uh, and the trajectory of uh, the strategic environment uh, is not expected to, to change substantially. And so the decision to pursue uh, the trilateral partnership with our oldest allies and partners, the United States and the United Kingdom, is about securing our, or protecting our security and our prosperity, as all countries do. Uh, it's about making a contribution to regional stability. And we'll continue to work not just with those traditional partners and allies, but across a whole range of relationships in the region and, again, more broadly. And I've spoken about these in this chamber before. I've spoken about our engagements with ASEAN, very much focused on the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, at the centre of our perceptions of the Indo-Pacific, spoken about our relationships across the Five Eyes in terms of intelligence sharing, spoken about our more contemporary relationships in the Quad itself as a new uh, and innovative uh, focused group of four leading democracies uh, addressing some of the key issues which also challenge our strategic environment, like climate change, uh, like the vaccine challenge that we've spoken about in this chamber this week, uh, like um, Minister, uh, cyber Minister, and critical technologies. Your time has expired. Senator Griff, a supplementary question. Minister, strategic an analysts from SP suggest the likelihood of conflict with China is greatest in the next five years, long before any new subs arrive. They also suggest conflict is most likely to occur in Taiwan, conflict the Defence Minister has committed us to fighting. Minister, wouldn't it be more prudent for us to invest in equipment that would be available in the coming years when the risk is perceived to be greater? Minister. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr President, and I can absolutely assure Senator Griff and the Chamber uh, that these two things are not mutually exclusive and that that is, the, that is not the approach that the government is taking, not an either-or approach. In fact, we are doing both. And any reference to the record, for example, of the uh, OSMIN meetings of the last two years, both 2020 and 2021, uh, provides uh, a very clear indicator of the government's commitments and ambitions in that regard. And as you say, the Defence Minister has spoken of those uh, in, his, uh, in his recent comments. So we will work closely, as I said, with those counterparts in the region, with ASEAN, with our Quad partners, with our Five Eyes partners, with the European Union, particularly given their Indo-Pacific strategy recently released. I was speaking to the Canadian Foreign Minister uh, last, the new Canadian Foreign Minister uh, last week in relation to uh, the work that Canada is also doing in this area. Australia is not the only country, by any stretch, 
by any consideration Minister, who is facing these issues Minister, and addressing these issues head on. Your time has expired. Senator Griff, a second supplementary. Uh, some ministers have made the claim uh, that we need to invest in defence because, and I'll quote, without sovereignty you don't have a country, end of quote. Hasn't the government already compromised Australia's sovereignty by the defence minister stating that in any armed conflict between China and the United States, Australia is locked into sending Australia's finest young men and women into that theatre of war? Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Griff for his uh, second supplementary question. The focus on sovereignty is one which is a key priority for the government. And in all of the uh, comments and uh, speeches and remarks that have been made from the Prime Minister to myself to the Defence Minister uh, over a period of time, an extended period of time, uh, our absolute priority has been Australia's national interests and protecting Australia's sovereignty. The Australian people expect no less and the Australian people deserve no less. Senator Marielle Smith. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. As then Minister for Social Services, in 2015, minister Mr Morrison removed the exemption for parents who are conscientious objectors to children's vaccinations, implementing what he called no jab, no play and no pay. This month, Mr Morrison declared it was time for governments to step back and that he wasn't in favour of mandatory vaccines. Can the minister clarify what Mr Morrison's position on vaccination of children is? The minister, rep order. the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Uh, thanks, Senator Smith, uh, for the question. And, uh, it's, uh, it's a very important question. Uh, the no jab, no pay policy uh, worked very effectively and continues to work very effectively to help to encourage uh, Australia to meet and to achieve uh, some of the highest rates of childhood vaccination and immunisation in the world. Um, uh, the policy was implemented uh, after it had been identified that there were uh, areas of decline uh, in relation to childhood vaccination occurring uh, and that those areas of decline uh, were um, obvious in particular communities around the country uh, and that it was crucial to uh, create uh, stronger incentives uh, for people to make the decision and the choice uh, to have their children vaccinated. Pleasingly, Mr President, uh, those policies have worked. Uh, and indeed, uh, I am sure uh, the success of childhood vaccination in Australia is one of the reasons why the COVID-19 vaccination program has also been so successful across this country. Uh, that we are a nation overwhelmingly uh, of uh, vaccinators, if you like, Mr. President, uh, people who recognise uh, the medical benefits of vaccination, uh, and importantly, a program like uh, No Jab, No Pay uh, was structured. Uh, to particularly motivate those who may just not have gotten around uh, to getting a vaccination, um, crucially to encourage uh, people and to make sure they are very aware uh, of the importance of that and to think it through seriously uh, if they are not going to do so. Uh, we know that that program has worked, has lifted vaccination rates across Australian children once again uh, and in doing so has protected uh, not just those who have been vaccinated but, of course, importantly, has helped to protect even those children who have not been vaccinated uh, by continuing to maintain high levels of herd immunity uh, for a number of childhood diseases. Senator Smith. Does Mr Morrison agree with Senator Rennick that, and I quote, children do not need to take the vaccine? Minister. Uh, thanks, Mr President. Uh, well, at present, um, COVID-19 vaccines are not approved uh, for uh, children under the age of 12 um, unless there are um, exceptional or extenuating medical circumstances. Uh, so at present, uh, indeed, uh, children are not approved to receive that vaccine. Uh, the government, uh, through the Therapeutic Goods Administration, uh, is reviewing the evidence in relation to childhood vaccination. Uh, the United States is one of the few countries in the world to have begun Senator a population-wide rollout of vaccines to children. Uh, we now look forward to having the benefit uh, of that data and evidence to inform the approvals process, uh, the safety, the dosage rates and information for Australian children. Uh, once the TGA has completed its work, ATAGI will do likewise, uh, and assuming approvals are granted, the government stands ready uh, to both 
deliver uh, and see administration of vaccines to Australian children uh, for COVID-19 and will encourage all parents to do that once those Minister, safeguards are in place. Minister, Senator Smith, a second supplementary. Senator Rennick has claimed that vaccinating children against COVID-19 is more likely to increase risk of ill health. Does Senator Rennick's claim reflect medical advice? And if not, will Mr Morrison publicly rebuke Senator Rennick's statements? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. Um, uh, vaccination can elicit concern in many. Vaccinating children can elicit even more concern, particularly in parents. Uh, and so uh, I would uh, urge all to be responsible in their comments and not to create unnecessary fear or concern in relation uh, to vaccine programs at all, but particularly in relation to childhood vaccination. Uh, the government, the government uh, from the Prime Minister down, will make sure that when we have that advice from the TGA and ATAGI, Senator that is the advice that we take to the nation. Australians should have confidence that we will act on the health expertise, medical science and best possible advice and information, and that when we recommend childhood vaccinations occur, it will be because they are safe, they are credible and they will help uh, to fight against COVID and to protect Minister, Australia's children. Minister, your time has expired. Senator Bragg. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. Can the Minister outline what steps the government is taking to keep Australians safe and to ensure that we are well placed to deal with the new COVID-19 variant of concern? The Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Bragg for the question. And Mr President, as we have done uh, throughout the entire pandemic, the Morrison government has acted quickly but cautiously to protect the livelihoods and lives of Australians. On the 28th of November, the Minister for Health signed a biosecurity determination preventing people who have been in an Omicron high-risk country in the previous 14 days from entering Australia unless they are an Australian citizen, permanent resident, immediate family member of a citizen or are otherwise exempt. Omicron high-risk countries for this determination are the eight southern African countries of Botswana, Eswatini, Lesotho, Malawi, Mozambique, Namibia, South Africa and Zimbabwe. Direct flights from these countries will not be permitted until 12 December. In addition, and based on the advice of the Chief Medical Officer of Australia, the National Security Committee of Cabinet has taken the necessary and temporary decision to pause the next step to safely reopen Australia to vaccinated visa holders, including skilled and student cohorts, until 15 December. This includes the reopening to Japan and Korea. Mr President, this temporary pause will ensure Australia can gather the information we need to better understand the Omicron variant, including the efficacy of the vaccine, the range of illness, including if it may generate more mild symptoms, and the level of transmission. As is the case currently, all persons entering Australia must make an Australian travel declaration before they arrive. Uh, again, on behalf of the government, I can assure all Australians we're taking the cautious approach we have had throughout the pandemic to protect the lives and livelihoods of Australians. Senator Bragg, a supplementary question. Mr. President, how has Australia's experience in dealing with COVID-19 to date given us the opportunity to take this cautious action? Minister. Thank you, Mr President. The strong measures that we took at the start of the pandemic have ensured that we fared better than most countries in dealing with COVID-19. Our closure of the border to China was a significant step that allowed us to continue protecting Australian lives and livelihoods. Over 12 per cent of people in the USA and 11 per cent of people in the UK have had COVID-19. When you contrast that to Australia, 0.4 per cent of Australians have had COVID-19. Of the 38 developed OECD countries, Australia has had the second lowest number of COVID-19 cases on a per capita basis. 
And again, on a per capita basis, the UK and USA have had over 40 times the number of COVID deaths compared to Australia. By avoiding the death rates of OECD countries, we have saved, as Australians, around 30,000 lives. Senator Bragg, a second supplementary. Thanks, Mr President. Uh, what can each and every Australian do to allow Australia to continue to safely reopen to the world? Minister. Well, Mr President, as the Leader of the Government in the Senate uh, has said, the best way for each and every Australian to protect themselves, uh, and not just themselves but their family and their community, is of course to get vaccinated. Without a doubt, again, as the Leader of the Government has pointed out today, uh, we have done an amazing job as Australians, with now some of the highest vaccination rates in the world. And of that, we can all be incredibly proud. Australia now has the equal 10th highest with Norway, first dose vaccination rate in the OECD. Australia's full vaccination rate is ranked 14th highest. Mr President, we know that vaccination against COVID-19 reduces the risk of the virus. And while must, at this point in time uh, we don't know about the new variant, uh, of course vaccination will continue to protect us. We can of course again be confident we will emerge Minister. on the other side. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is for the Minister representing the Minister for Housing, Minister Rustin. Minister, Tasmania's housing crisis is at boiling point. The average Hobart renter is paying nearly a third of their income to keep a roof over their head, and that's on a good day. We've got people sleeping in their cars, families are camping out in friends' living rooms, and meanwhile, your government is running yet another talk fest inquiry on housing affordability. We don't need another inquiry. Your answers are already there. We already, need to, we already know what we need to do. We need more affordable housing. Why can't your government see this and what action will you actually take instead of having just another talk fest? The minister representing the Minister for Housing, in this case uh, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr President. I thank Senator Lambie uh, for her question, uh, although I, uh, I reject some of the characterisation uh, in that question. Indeed, uh, our government has pursued multiple policies and is making multiple investments uh, to support uh, access to housing across Australia. Uh, we're providing an expected $9 billion uh, through 2021-22 uh, to support housing and homelessness across the country, which includes around $1.6 billion Mr. President, being provided uh, to the states to meet uh, their responsibility in support for housing and homelessness. As a government, Mr. President, we have put a particular priority uh, in relation to supporting home ownership and to supporting more first homeowners uh, into uh, home ownership. And we are very pleased that programs our government has delivered over the last few years under Prime Minister Morrison, from Home Builder through to the Home Guarantee schemes, including the First Home Guarantee, the New Home Guarantee and the Family Home Guarantee, have helped more than 300,000 Australians to become homeowners. In the middle of a pandemic, we have seen first homeowner numbers at their highest level in nearly 15 years. Mr. President. That is something that, as parties of government that have long championed from our very foundation the importance of home ownership, uh, we take great pride in seeing that achievement. We have made sure Mr. President, that we put in place the policies to help those Australians who might have struggled to get a deposit to be able to get a deposit and get into the housing market uh, more easily. That is what our home guarantee schemes are doing, and in this year's budget we made the extension of that home guarantee scheme into particularly supporting single parents to be able uh, to access a home deposit and the opportunity of home ownership. And we know that that is one of the best ways to provide a lifetime of economic security, uh, particularly uh, through retirement years alongside of successful uh, retirement savings policies. Senator Lambie, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, the head of your talk first inquiry, the member for McKellar, said last week that a housing affordability crisis is a moral failure by the state and local governments. Isn't the fact that we have people sleeping in their cars a moral failure on the federal government as well, or is it that it's everyone else's fault, like usual? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Well, in addition to the policies uh, that I spoke about before, uh, and particularly the billions of dollars in, uh, in funding, including uh, to the states and territories, 
uh, the work of our National Housing Financing and Investment Corporation uh, and its infrastructure facility in particular has supported the delivery uh, of over 6,600 new social, affordable and market dwellings. Uh, so, Mr President, uh, we have pursued uh, policies and continue to deliver policies across the country uh, that uh, have helped uh, with the delivery of additional social housing uh, and affordable dwellings around the country. Uh, that help states and territories in the provision uh, of support uh, for homelessness uh, and delivery of those policies, and Mr. President, that have helped more than 300,000 Australians. I, 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 I hear Senator McKim inviting me to tell, uh, tell him about our tax policies. We're well, one and a half billion dollars extra Order. into the pockets of hardworking Senator Australians McKim. every month. That's also Senator helping McKim. Australians to pay for their mortgages, for their rents, for Order. their homes. Senator McKim. Senator Lambie, a second supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. There are more than 4,000 people on the social housing wait list in Tasmania right now. It takes only 18 months on a good day for the neediest applicants to get put into a home. My staff are taking calls from people who are at their wits' end, and we're having to tell them there's, no, there's nothing we can do. The housing just isn't there. Your government holds the purse strings, Minister. We've seen this through COVID. This is happening on your watch. You have the power to turn this around. Why aren't you paying for the social housing? We know that we need. Order. Order. Senator Abetz, Senator Lambie. Are you rising on a point of order, Senator Hanson Young? Yes, yes I am, uh, Mr. President. I don't think it's appropriate, given what has been handed down today, to have growling and dog noises coming from this side of the chamber while a female member in this place is on her feet. It happened. I don't know who is responsible for it, but it is inappropriate. And if we are going to change culture Senator, from the top, that means all of us. Senator Hanson Young, I said, Senator Wong. Uh, well, I did because I in fact said, who's growling? Um, and I would ask one of the senators at that end, perhaps to do the right thing uh, and withdraw. At I'll least fess up. I, I, Gee, you're tough, aren't you? You have to dish it out and not happy to take responsibility. I mean, really. Growling, Mr. President. Senator Wong, I certainly did not I did. hear anything. Uh, Senator Wong, I'm not challenging what you heard. I certainly did not hear. I cannot ask someone to withdraw something I did not hear. Um, order, order. Interjections as. Order. Senator Molan. Senator Wong. Senator Molan. Senator Wong. Interjections, as everyone in this chamber has heard on many, on many occasions, are disorderly. Uh, I did call uh, a senator who interjected across the chamber on uh, my right to order. Uh, I did not hear the particular um, incident that you have raised. If it occurred, I would ask the senator involved to reflect upon it and to withdraw if they uh, did do what has been stated. Uh, however, I did not hear the particular interjection myself. Uh, I'm calling, I think I'm calling the minister. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Well, Mr. President, uh, I do reject a number of the assertions in Senator Lambie's uh, supplementary question. Uh, our government uh, is taking uh, the most comprehensive suite of policies to support housing and homelessness. Uh, the work of NIFIC, uh, which I referenced before, uh, delivering thousands of additional uh, houses, uh, low, uh, low, in low income and affordable houses and dwellings through its operation. Uh, the work under our national partnership agreement uh, with the states and territories, providing $1.6 billion a year to them. The work uh, in relation uh, to home ownership that I referenced before, driving those home ownership rates higher, uh, which we are uh, so pleased to see and which we will continue to pursue and support as a government, those 300,000 plus additional homeowners uh, that we've managed to achieve as a result of these policy settings. And indeed, specifically in relation to Tasmania, uh, the work to provide uh, a waiver of more than $150 million to the Tasmanian government in relation to their housing-related debts to help them pursue Minister, policies too. Minister, time has expired. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. 
In early November, President Biden announced the US had already enough vaccine supply for every child in America and had already commenced the process of packing and shipping out vaccine doses. Are there paediatric uh, COVID-19 vaccine doses already in Australia? And if not, on what date will the vials of COVID-19 vaccines for children aged 5 to 11 arrive on Australian shore? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Thank uh, Senator for the question. Uh, as Senator uh, Birmingham indicated earlier, there is uh, at this point in time uh, no approved uh, vaccine available for children 5 to 12. That process is still being undertaken by uh, uh, research that's being done by ATAGI and, of course, uh, will also be followed up by the appropriate work by the TGA, Mr. President. So we don't, at this point in time, have uh, an approved vaccine available for um, children aged five to 12, Mr. President. Uh, while that process uh, is continuing, Mr. President, uh, preparations are being made to ensure that uh, if the appropriate approvals are put in place, Mr. President. We have supplies available to us to commence a vaccination program, but at this point in time, Mr. President, we don't have the full range of data to be able to approve uh, a vaccine program for children aged five Minister, to seven. Minister, resume your seat. Senator, Senator Gallagher, on a point, point of order, order on re relevance, and I was listening carefully to the minister. But the question was whether we have any vaccine. Uh, paediatric doses of the vaccine available in Australia now or when they're coming, not whether they've been approved or not. We know they haven't been approved. The question was very specific to the actual issue of supply of vaccine. Uh, I, I, I will allow you to draw the minister back to the question. I've been listening carefully. Uh, I, uh, I, I, Minister, I, I will give you the call, but uh, Senator Gallagher has brought you back to the question. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, and I'd invite the opposition to listen to my answer because I did say during my answer uh, that has just had a point of order taken on it, possibly just for the point of interruption and taking a point of order, but that we would ensure while that process was occurring that we would have supplies available for us in time to commence a vaccination program for uh, children by aged uh, 5 to 12 uh, if and when the vaccination program uh, uh, was approved by the you clearly didn't you clearly didn't read the respect at work report today did you senator um, Order. so mr president uh, we are making sure that uh, while the investigative work that's being done by the by ATAGI uh, and by uh, the TGA Minister, undertaken. We're Minister, ready to start your program. time has expired. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. I take it that there are no paediatric doses in, in the country at the moment. So will the Morrison go government guarantee that there will be sufficient supply for an immediate rollout as soon as a TAGI approval for vaccination of children aged 5 to 11 is obtained? Minister. Order. 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 Order on my right. Order on my left. Order. I will call the minister once there's silence in the chamber. Senator Gallagher. Minister. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Gallagher has just demonstrated what happens when you have a pre-prepared answer or question and don't listen to the uh, answer to the first question, Mr. President. I indicated a number of times during my answer to the first question, uh, while the processes that are being undertaken for the approval or otherwise of a vaccination program for children aged 5 to 12, arrangements are being put in place to ensure that when when and if that process occurs, we have vaccines available for children uh, as a part of a vaccination program. I've said it uh, three or four times now, and it's disappointing that the Labor Party don't even bother to listen to the answers that have been given to the questions. 
Uh, Senator Gallagher, a second supplementary question. I do question. have uh, a second supplementary. Thank you, Mr President. Given there is competition around the world for these paediatric vaccine doses and with Omicron variant emerging, will the minister assure Australian parents there will be no shortage of vaccines for their children? And does Mr Morrison accept that this is a race? Minister. Minister, you have the call. Uh, thank Senator you. Hughes, order. Thank you, Mr President. Can I say it is, it is really Order quite, on my left. It is really quite disappointing that the Labor Party try to confuse the Omicron circumstance route right now uh, with the proposals that are being developed for the vaccination program for five to twelve year olds, Mr. President. So Mr. President, so the Labor Party are trying to drive fear into the Australian community with questions they don't they're not interested in the, la the answer, Mr. President quite clearly by their interjections across the chamber. They're not interested Order. in what the government's got to say in respect of this matter, Mr President. Uh, and I've indicated already a number of times in each of my answers Order. that as a part of our process in preparation for this, uh, in the circumstance when the uh, ATAGI and the, uh, and, and the TGA approve a vaccine, there will be vaccines available for a, a program for Australian children. Senator Davey. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Emergency Management and National Recovery and Resilience, Senator Mackenzie. Senator Mackenzie, we've recently seen some quite devastating flooding in the north of New South Wales and southwest of Queensland. We've seen some crops destroyed just when farmers thought that they were going to be able to start repaying the bank. Can the minister please update the Senate on what the Liberals and Nationals in government are doing to keep Australians safe, to provide support to the communities that are affected by recent floods and severe weather, and uh, some information for the communities that are right at this very minute watching their TV screens and listening to the weather reports in trepidation. Minister for Emergency Management, Senator Mackenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. I thank Senator Davey for her question and her, for her ongoing advocacy for regional New South Wales. I'm sure everyone in this place will agree that flooding and severe weather we're seeing in New South Wales at the moment is very, very concerning. That's why our government is already providing assistance to New South Wales through the disaster recovery funding arrangements. It's the primary way uh, we can provide support to states and territories that are affected by disasters. And this year, we've put in a new streamlined process for activating DRFA assistance so that we, as a Commonwealth, can respond more quickly following severe disasters. We've been working very closely with New South Wales on ensuring that we deliver the support needed where it's needed. And for that reason, we've extended that funding from the original seven local government areas identified by New South Wales earlier this month to another 13 local government areas last Friday. And we stand ready to extend that support again should New South Wales need further assistance. The support currently being provided covers the critical early needs of a community following a disaster, support for people suffering through hardship and distress, financial assistance for small businesses and primary producers, and funding to clean up and repair damaged essential public assets. The DRFA continues to be the most effective and immediate way that our government can support Australians affected by disasters, helping them to get back on their feet and to keep them safe. In the last decade, we've provided over $12 billion in funding to states and territories through this mechanism. And in the last few weeks alone, in addition to the support we've provided to New South Wales, we've also worked closely with other states and territories to get assistance to Australians on the ground. Queensland, who also experienced flooding earlier this month across five local government areas. South Australia, 24 LGAs. And I'd like to shout out to Rowan Ramsey from the other place for his strong advocacy uh, for the farmers there. And in Victoria, Minister, prolonged power outage payments. Minister, your time has expired. Uh, Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Yes, uh, thank you. Minister, we've got forecasts that will see a wetter than average summer. We're now predicted to be in a La Nina weather cycle, which normally brings increased rain and higher chances of flooding. Um, this will lead to more flooding across the east of the country. What 
is our government doing to mitigate against flood damage and to help with the repair bill, but also to prepare for future flooding events? Minister. Thank you. With La Nina established in our region, we're certainly going to see higher than average rainfalls across many parts of the country. And unfortunately, that means more flooding in the east and cyclones to our north. We know floods are the most costly natural disaster, and that's why flood mitigation is such a high impact investment. We also know from the findings of the Royal Commission that flood mitigation is incredibly important. Building resilience saves recovery costs later on. Today, I was very proud to announce that applications are open for the second round of national flood mitigation, uh, representing an, we're absolutely putting another $50 million of investment uh, on the table for flood mitigation, bringing a total investment by our government to $100 million for the last two years, and building on the strong demand that we saw across the country. The National Flood Mitigation Program will be funded from our Emergency Response Fund, which is a future-focused, dedicated, sustainable investment fund. Senator Davey, a second supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister please explain how the Emergency Response Fund operates? how people can access it and how it can be used to better prepare Australia for natural disasters. Minister. Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, as I said, it is a national program and it will be delivered in partnership with states and territories. And I encourage all local governments to work closely with their jurisdiction uh, to apply over coming months. The Emergency Response Fund is a dedicated investment fund created with approximately $4 billion and established in 2019. The Act is very, very prescriptive in how the $200 million is available to be accessed each financial year and how we as a government can actually use that. $50 million each year can be used to build resilience and prepare for or reduce the risk of future natural disasters, which is the announcement I made today on flood mitigation funding. $150 million each financial year can be available to fund emergency response and recovering following natural disasters in Australia that have a significant or catastrophic impact when the government determines that existing recovery programs are insufficient to meet the scale of the response. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, pursuant to Standing Order 745A, I seek an explanation from the uh, minister representing the Prime Minister as to why question uh, on notice number 3985 has still not been answered. Minister. <coughs> thanks, uh, thanks, Deputy President. I thank Senator uh, Patrick uh, for his uh, question. Um, uh, I have had uh, um, a few things on just, uh, just of late. I don't have to hand since uh, getting uh, notice that Senator Patrick was going to make this inquiry and update in relation to uh, the status uh, of, uh, of that answer. Okay. Uh, Mr President, as, uh, as I've noted in this place before, uh, the government uh, continues to process through questions on notice in this chamber uh, and questions on notice uh, taken through Senate estimates processes as well as committee processes, uh, unparalleled numbers uh, of uh, questions uh, and to process answers to them. Um, uh, I apologise in relation to uh, delays that occur uh, from time to time in relation to uh, some answers uh, uh, making their way to the chamber, uh, but, uh, but do acknowledge uh, the hard work that, uh, that goes, uh, goes in by many uh, officials and others uh, to providing uh, the record numbers of, uh, of answers we have managed to facilitate through this parliament uh, to uh, two questions. Senator Patrick. Thank you. I rise to take note of the minister's answer. Uh, although it is really just a repeat of the answer we received last week, and I do inform the, uh, the minister that I did advise uh, his office this morning that I was seeking that answer. Uh, I did that very early, um, so um, uh, I will proceed. Now, last week, when I rose to seek an explanation expressing my concern that my question, particularly relating to the national cabinet, and there is a bit of irony in what the minister said, because part two of this question is a question I've had to ask three times. Three times I had to ask the question because, uh, in subsequent uh, uh, answers, the, the, the Prime Minister has simply said <coughs> no charges have been levied at this point. Um, and that relates to a matter that was before the AAT, not this year, but last year. 
that uh, where the Prime Minister also lost uh, in, in relation to an FOI. So, um, <clears throat> Uh, I understand there may be lots of questions, but this one is one that has been asked for a third time. Um, <coughs> uh, the, the question I'm seeking an answer on is a question relating to the cost uh, of proceedings in the AAT, how much the Prime Minister is spending trying to defend uh, untenable FOI exemption positions. <coughs> I don't understand why, how, why the, the Prime Minister's staff just can't go to the accounting system and get the answer from me. Uh, for me. <coughs> Excuse me. In taking note last time, um, I expressed a serious concern regarding a recent decision by a senior official in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet thank you, uh, to override Justice White's decision that National Cabinet is not a committee of the Cabinet. That's right, a bureaucrat overturned a justice of the federal court on the meaning of a statutory expression. Now, since becoming a senator, I have submitted about 200 FOIs. If I uh, had to guess, it's probably on the north side of 200. <coughs> I've not liked some of the decisions I've received, but in, in those cases, I've appealed them. Uh, uh, the, the score, thank you, Senator Scar, is actually I think it's about 14-2. Okay, so uh, um, and that includes some state ones, but. Uh, rel been relatively successful on, uh, in the appeals, but that's the approach I normally take. Is if I don't like a decision, I appeal it. It wasn't until last week that I stood up in the chamber and said something about a decision maker in respect of the decision I had received. And the difference in, in this instance is the fact that a bureaucrat thought it in their remit to overturn a judicial officer in favour of the opinion and interests of her political master. That occurred either under an inappropriate direction because FOI decision makers make independent decisions or because the decision maker was trimming her sails to the political winds in her own career interest ahead of her public service obligation. PMC didn't like what I, what I had to say. The Secretary of PMC, Mr uh, Philip Gaitchens, has written to the President of the Senate complaining that I sought to hold a public official to account and in that regard, I seek to table the letter that was sent to the president in relation to that. <clears throat> I'll do so in fairness because there is crit criticism of me in this, in this letter. Is leave granted? I don't believe there's an objection. <clears throat> uh, Senator Patrick is seeking to um, submit a letter from Mr Gagens, I understand. Correctly, correct, to the President of the, to the, president. Of the Senate, and, uh, and I did uh, run that by Senator um, Smith and uh, the, the other leaders prior. Yep. Take that as uh, table. Thank you. Now, Mr Gagens didn't like the fact that I suggested his employee breached her obligation or was directed to make a decision contrary to law. He did not like that I spoke of her actions as being incompetent abhor or abhorrent or politicised. Now, until yesterday, I would have taken the comment that the official wasn't directed and I would have withdrawn my remarks about Ms Mackenzie being directed to make a decision contrary to law. But that uh, withdrawal, withdrawal would still have left me backing my other comments. No one, without being politicised or simply stupid, or both, could make the decision that she did. Moreover, Mr Gaitchen's flexible attitude towards the truth to serve his own political master has now been confirmed through another FOI decision that I received last night, made by another uh, 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 official, PMNC official, Assistant Secretary Hugh Cameron who yesterday used what was effectively a pro forma decision-making uh, template to claim exactly the same thing, stating that he is, and I quote, of the opinion that National Cabinet is a committee of the Cabinet and therefore National Cabinet documents are exempt from disclosure under section 34 of the FOI Act. That's two. Two senior officials have now sought to ignore the ruling of a federal court justice. Some might think it's unconventional that I come into this chamber and start naming public officials, but there are conventions being broken inside government that are far more harmful 
in respect of uh, uh, damage to institutions. Mr Cameron's decision is to all intents a carbon copy of Ms McKenzie's. So here we have another bureaucrat in the Prime Minister's department arrogantly asserting that he is more learned than a judge when it comes to the law. Here we have another official politicised and disrespectful to the rule of law. Presumably he, he too will get a pat on the head from Mr Gaitchens. But in actual fact, it's a case of Tweedledee and, with Mr Cameron, Tweedledummer. And to think that the Secretary of PMC would write to the Senate, to the President, seeking sympathy when the Senate itself has resolved that it will not accept National Cabinet as a public interest immunity relating to Cabinet deliberations. Mr Gaitchen's uh, claim, uh, claim in uh, me taking on officials is that I have, uh, I have undermined public confidence in the Australian public service. Now that is laughable coming from the grub of a man that Mr Gaitchen is. Uh, this is Senator, a fellow. Senator Patrick, it's not appropriate to reflect. I would ask you to consider withdrawing that on that way about a public Well, statement. how about you hear my evidence first and then uh, we'll... uh, Senator Patrick, I, I am asking you to withdraw. All right, I'll withdraw. Thank you, Senator. But Patrick. this is a fellow, um, Madam uh, Deputy President, who, who, who um, hasn't led the public service in a, in a highly professional way. Sure, he's been a, a, political, uh, a public servant in government for a long term, time, but that doesn't make him a true public servant. Instead, he has he's been happy to act as the Prime Minister's henchman, covering up all manner of sins and corruption in the government and particularly other ministers' offices. The Secretary of, of, of PMC is a cover-up expert. If there is some dark secret that the government needs to bury, Gaitchens is the man who's got the shovel. He's been helping the PM in sending all, uh, all manner of stuff, all manner of uh, dirty secrets and sins off to the Governance Committee of Cabinet to be buried for the next 20 years in the vaults of the National Archive. So, Mr Gaitchens, you are a disgrace. It is you that have undermined confidence in the public service. I know there are very good people in the Australian public service, but as, as it is said, a fish rots from the head, and when the head is rotten, no one is likely to have faith in the remainder of the fish. In closing, and I note that so low is Gaitchen's estimate of his own standing, he has had to try and bolster his doubtful credibility uh, of his letter by roping in the Australian Public Service Commissioner, Peter Walcroft, uh, Walcott, to, in, and uh, has had him co-sign the letter. Mr uh, Walcott, you should be more careful of the company you keep. Tying yourself up to a political deadbeat like Gaitchen's was a foolish move that won't enhance your reputation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Patrick. Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks Deputy President. Deputy President, uh, uh, I would not usually uh, rise to, uh, to speak uh, on, uh, on a motion to, uh, to take note, uh, particularly a motion to take note of, uh, of an answer that I had given myself. Uh, however, we have uh, just seen uh, quite uh, an extraordinary display uh, by Senator Patrick. Uh, Order, Senator Patrick. Uh, Senator, Senators. Uh, Senators, I will call you to order, please. The minister has the right to be heard in silence. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, uh, we have just seen a most extraordinary uh, display by Senator Patrick uh, impugning motives uh, against uh, senior officials in the Australian Public Service, uh, doing so um, uh, having uh, already, uh, on a previous occasion, singled out in quite an extraordinary uh, way. Uh, an individual senior public servant. Um, Order. It, is, it is entirely appropriate, uh, Mr. President, uh, Deputy President. It is entirely appropriate uh, for the Secretary Order. of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet uh, to seek to defend uh, public servants uh, working across the Australian public service uh, from uh, from being uh, brought into uh, improper political debate. Uh, those of us. Deputy. Senator Patrick, 
We've I do, heard I do you note in silence. That I would ask you to have the same respect back to the minister. Minister. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, those of us who, uh, who serve in public office uh, are fair game in this place uh, for, uh, for uh, the political debates uh, that occur. Uh, we bring many public servants uh, into the limelight as part of Senate estimates processes and other processes of government uh, to, uh, to provide and the opportunity for questioning uh, and, uh, and the opportunity for information gathering uh, across uh, our democratic processes. Uh, but we ought to respect uh, that those public servants, Deputy President, are not elected officials. They are not public officials. Uh, they, are, uh, they are individuals. They are individuals who, uh, who rightly uh, have accountability mechanisms and processes in place uh, for the way in which they conduct their duties. Uh, and of course, uh, as ministers, uh, we are responsible uh, for the work uh, of our departments. Uh, and for addressing those matters. Uh, I acknowledge that overwhelmingly members of this place, members of the other place, uh, have respected uh, the work of the Australian Public Service uh, and not sought uh, to create uh, this type of uh, politicised attack uh, on individuals within it. Uh, I acknowledge that, uh, that uh, the President will consider the matters uh, before him and, if necessary, the Privileges Committee consider those matters, uh, but certainly on behalf of the government, I uh, wish to make clear our respect uh, for the work of our public service officials uh, and those leaders, uh, including those individuals uh, who have been maligned in the comments by Senator Patrick. Thank you, Minister. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Patrick be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Ayres. Thanks, um, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answer given by Senator Birmingham to the question asked by Senator McCarthy. Um, and, uh, and I do that in the context of the last few question times having a slightly different quality, with the absence of Senators Rennick and Antic. Um, without heckle and jekyll, I've missed Senator Rennick's heckling during the course of um, this will be good. Please resume yep. your seat. Uh, Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, point of order, Chair. Uh, it's not appropriate for a senator to reflect on the absence of another senator. Um, that is true. Thank you for reminding me, Senator O'Sullivan. Um, I'll just remind Senator Ayres of that. So, particularly uh, during this COVID period when it, it has been difficult for senators to attend this place, um, the, the agreed custom is that we don't refer to senators being here or not being here. Thank you, Senator Ayres. I'm just worried about them. Uh, the, well, one of their offices is next to mine. The lights are on, but nobody's home. The question is, are they in witness protection or are they voluntarily not attending? And I'll leave senators to reflect on that question. Senator McMahon and Senator Canavan, the other two rebel senators, the sort of uh, vaccine senators, at least they've got the courage to be in here. Uh, what I am really here to talk about is the government's failure uh, to deal with the COVID pandemic, the government's failure to manage its responsibilities in terms of quarantine. See, in the face of national crisis, some governments rise to the occasion and some governments wilt in the face of crisis. Former Prime Minister Menzies wilted in the face of Australia's existential crisis in the Second World War. And Prime Ministers Curtin and then Chifley rose to the occasion, united Australia, got the strategy right and built a post-war Australia that was the foundation for the second half of the 20th century. The Morrison government's approach to the COVID pandemic looks a lot more like Menzies' approach and failure to the Second World War than it does to a government that really grasps its responsibilities. Mr Morrison has been incapable of taking action when it's required in the face of the COVID pandemic. 
He's certainly been incapable of taking responsibility and he's been incapable of grasping his own role in a time of national crisis. The failures on quarantine are, of course, not the only failure of the Morrison government. The failure on delivery of vaccines for Australia at the time it was promised, in time to avoid the Southern Hemisphere winter, have been described as, they be, as the biggest public policy failure in Australian history. Mr Morrison failed to purchase the vaccines in time, and when everything went wrong— uh, Just a moment, Senator Ayres. Resume your seat. Senator McLaughlin. Uh, as much as I'm enjoying uh, my honourable friend's um, contribution to the chamber, I listened carefully to Senator Birmingham's response to Senator McCarthy's uh, answer, and that was directly related to the question, and the answer was directly related to quarantine facilities and not vaccines. I ask you to bring my honourable <coughs> friend back to the question and answer. Uh, thank you, Senator McLaughlin. The question was about uh, there was a question on uh, quarantine and in relation to the new outbreak. So I would ask Senator Ayres to, uh, whilst this is a broad debate, I think he's probably gone broader than the uh, question. So I'd ask you to bring your response back to those issues. Thank you, Senator Ayres. I, I certainly will. What did Mr Morrison do when confronted with these failures? He blamed the states. It's a bit like blaming the fire brigade when they turn up to your house because you get a little bit wet. Blaming the states. The pandemic took off because of Mr Morrison's failure on vaccines and on quarantine. That's why we've had almost six months of lockdowns on the East Coast. Failure on quarantine, failure to do his job, set out clearly in the Constitution. And it's not just Labor who says that, that, that quarantine is fundamental to getting the national strategy right. Ms Holton pointed that out in her report. The responsibility is clear. And this morning, Ms Westacott said she couldn't understand why the federal government hadn't got this right. Quarantine vaccines. Who will Australians trust next year to deliver sufficient quarantine capability? Who will they trust to deliver booster vaccines? Well, I can tell you what, you wouldn't trust this lot, that's for sure. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Senator McLaughlin. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, I take a very differing view and uh, I like the Leader of the Government, have a very firm view that our quarantine policy and implementation have been exceptional and, well, and recognised around the world for achieving the great success in fighting COVID and its encroachment on our lives in this country. The Government has supported over 60,000 Australians to return, including 32,000 on 212 facilitated flights that have arrived with 32,000 people. We've worked in partnership with every state across the political divide to deliver quarantine facilities so they can return to the arms of their families. As the COVID impacts are, have evolved, so have the government responses. The government's invested $513.5 million into Howard Springs for the capacity for 2,000 return travellers. That is the language and action of success. The Centres for Natural Resilience under construction in Melbourne, 1,000 capacity, Brisbane, 500 capacity, Perth, 500 capacity. The government's response to the COVID crisis evolves as it should. The government is flexible in its response and committed to ensuring Australians remain safe, but also Australians overseas can return home through a process that keeps everyone in the community safe and healthy. The Centres for National Resilience will have an ongoing role as part of the government's national response. There is a need 
for purpose-built quarantine for people travelling to Australia from high-risk locations or who are unable to quarantine at home. These centres will provide adequate, enduring capability that will assist the Commonwealth now and into the future with health and emergency crises. They will be built and owned by the Commonwealth, and they will operate operated by the state governments. Implicit in my honourable friend's contribution prior to mine was a criticism of state governments. The state governments have worked in partnership with the Commonwealth. My honourable friend from the opposite side has in impl implicitly been criticising his own state Labor governments. I do not do so. The government is working quickly to ensure the construction of the centres is completed as soon as possible. In Victoria, we expect construction of the first 250 beds will be completed by the end of 2021. The next 250 in mid-January, with the last 500 of 1,000 beds completed in the first quarter of 2022. In Western Australia and Queensland, we are working towards construction of the first 500 beds at each site being completed by the first quarter of 2022. This capacity is in addition to the existing capacity of up to 2,000 beds at, the Howard, at Howard Springs. The government will make further decisions if it is necessary as circumstances unfold. I would like to take this opportunity in response to my honourable friend's contribution, uh, Senator Ayres, to say that the leadership shown by the Prime Minister has been unwavering in its commitment to the health and safety of all Australians. He's created a national cabinet which has enabled us to work in part as a government to work in partnership with the states to deliver the services required, including the vaccines, as my honourable friend had mentioned, to those that need them. There is an easy opportunity, well, a opportunity for many in the community, as is their right, to criticise the government's response. But I think people need to appreciate that this government has each and every day to look upon new, to look upon new circumstances and adjust its response to meet the same. I congratulate the Prime Minister on his leadership during this time. And I look forward to it continuing into the new year as the government works extraordinarily hard to ensure that we have and continue to have the lowest fatality rates, the highest vaccination rates and, importantly, the strongest economy. Thank you, Senator McLaughlin. Your time has expired. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, one of the recurring themes of the COVID pandemic in Australia has been this Prime Minister's failure to act, failure to act on advice, failure to act on the facts, uh, and no more than in the area of quarantine. We have known for close to two years uh, that construction of purpose-built quarantine facilities is vital to keeping COVID rates in Australia to a minimum. And despite that advice, despite report after report from the government's own hand-picked expert, Jane Holton, calling for purpose-built quarantine stations, we are still yet to see a single new quarantine station built by this government anywhere in the country. This pandemic has been going for nearly two years. This government has had ample opportunity to build purpose-built quarantine facilities, which would keep Australians safe. And the emergence of the Omicron uh, variant makes very clear that this pandemic is a long way from being over. It's very clear that we need to prepare for all circumstances, including the emergence of new variants about which we know very little uh, and which are most likely to be developing in other parts of the world and potentially being brought to Australia. That's why quarantine facilities are so important. Let's just look at how the most recent Delta outbreak commenced in Sydney. It commenced because we had a poorly vaccinated population because of the government's own failures on vaccine rollout, a poorly vaccinated population hit by a new variant 
entering the community because of the government's reliance on hotel quarantine. It was the fact that people were in hotel quarantine being transported from airports to hotel quarantine that led to the Delta variant uh, getting out, getting into the community and tragically leading to, to the deaths of Australians in a number of states, not to mention the enormous business losses that we've seen all around the country. That's why purpose-built quarantine matters and that's why it should have happened well before now. Um, now, it is the case, fortunately, that there are governments who are moving ahead with building quarantine stations. Uh, and in my state of Queensland, the Queensland government is well advanced uh, in getting the new WellCamp uh, quarantine station just outside Toowoomba being completed. And all indications are that it will be built by the end of this year. But even on this one, the Morrison government is nowhere to be seen. This quarantine station that is likely to be up and running before the end of the year will receive not a single dollar of federal government investment. Yet again, it's being left to the states, to Labor states, to carry the can for a government that fails to act in an area of its responsibility. Just like aged care, another area of gross failure by this government, quarantine is a federal government responsibility. There can be no doubt whose job it is to do this, and there can be no doubt who is dropping the ball, that is Prime Minister Scott Morrison and his government. The only other quarantine st station that is under construction in Queensland is at Pinkenbar near the, near the Brisbane airport. And I was alarmed to read a couple of weeks ago that the federal government is considering halving the number of places uh, that will be available at that quarantine station. It may turn out that that is a very short-sighted decision when we have the emergence of this new variant. Uh, now, the decision by the government to close or temporarily uh, extend the closure of Australia's international borders is, is a decision that Labor supports. We have always argued that we need to apply the precautionary principle when new variants emerge and new circumstances emerge. Uh, but that is causing real consternation in the tourism industry and the international education industry, which we're really looking forward to international borders starting to reopen. That's why purpose-built quarantine stations matter. Uh, if we are to have uh, confidence and security about the ability particularly to bring in international workers and international students into our country, we need to have that purpose-built quarantine facility uh, around the country to provide that kind of security and make sure that new variants aren't being brought into this country. Why is it that Mr Morrison is always so slow to act Nearly two years have elapsed since the beginning of this pandemic and we don't have a single new quarantine station. We saw it with the bushfires, we saw it with vaccines, we're seeing it now with quarantine as well. It's always too little too late from this uh, Prime Minister and he never takes responsibility even when the Constitution says that quarantine is his responsibility. Thank you, Senator Watts. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. I've been listening carefully to the contributions uh, this time of day. Uh, from Senator Ayres and Senator Watt, uh, speaking about the government's response to the COVID pandemic. Now, I'm very proud of the Morrison government's response to the COVID pandemic. I'm very proud of Australia's response to the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, it must be really difficult for, for Labor senators to have to come in here and trot out these lines, uh, you know, to live in that parallel universe, because like, their view of what Australia has done is, is far more pessimistic than the reality. Like it's actually not connected to reality at all because they're living in some sort of alternate, some sort of alternate universe here because Australia has actually tackled and, and dealt with the, the pandemic better than practically anywhere else in the world. In fact, if, if we had just the average death rate, the average death rate of the, uh, any OECD country, then uh, over 30,000 Australians would have uh, succumbed, uh, would have died to, uh, due to the, the COVID pandemic. Uh, we, we're not, not anywhere near that. Less, way less than 2,000, I believe, people have, have uh, succumbed to COVID uh, since, since the outbreak began. Uh, Australia has one of the highest rates of vaccination in the world. I don't know if you've seen that as well, uh, Labor senators. Uh, we have one of the highest rates of vaccination in the world. I mean, this is phenomenal. Uh, we, we, we've got over 85% double-dose vaccination 
uh, of people aged over 16 in Australia right now, and it's growing every day. Now, this is good news, but you won't hear anyone on that side of the chamber celebrate the success that the Australian people have achieved, that, the, that collectively, as, as Australians, that we have achieved. That you're not going to hear that because what do they do? They come in here. Now, it's really interesting. Senator actually. O'Sullivan, I'm going to draw your attention to the take note question, which was about quarantine facilities. Thank you. And, and well, the, the, the points that were raised, Madam President, uh, Deputy President, that in relation to uh, uh, into the handling of the the pandemic and. Uh, and, and, uh, and it was uh, the, the, the issue of uh, facilities was, uh, was, was, was the nature of the question. And, and in response to that, uh, I think it was uh, Senator Watt uh, referenced the fact that, uh, that often the, the, the breakouts in transmission actually occurred as people went from the, the airport uh, to a facility, to a hotel facility. Well, uh, that's not going to change if you've got a Resilience Centre. If you've got a COVID vaccination dedicated COVID uh, dedicated COVID quarantine centre, you, you still need to actually get people from the airstrip to. I mean, we're we going to build like a dedicated airport. I mean, I know that's what they've proposed in in Queensland to do. But how many actual air, airlines are actually going to go and land directly there? How, how many are actually going to land directly into these locations? Because we know that that's just not practical. Uh, what we need is, is resilience. Now, that's where vaccines are, are obviously the key, and that's what Australians have stepped up to do. Australians have stepped up to go and get vaccinated. Now, sadly, though, in my home state, uh, our vaccination rate hasn't been uh, kept up to pace with the rest of the country. Now, I don't blame uh, Western Australians uh, for the fact that uh, you know the reality is in WA we've had uh, one of the best experiences in dealing with COVID uh, of anywhere else in, in Australia, and indeed anywhere else in the world. And so there has been a, 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 a I guess a lack, a lack of urgency there in Western Australia that uh, maybe has contributed somewhat to our, our lower rate of vaccinations. But it's interesting uh, when you see what's happened of late since there's been these uh, mandatory. Uh, mandatory vaccinations Senator O'Sullivan, upon... the question was about quarantine. Uh, it's not a debating point. I'm directing you specifically to the take note response. Senator Smith. With due respect, it's difficult to talk about quarantine uh, without Senator talking Smith, about vaccination you rates. are debating okay. with me. I am directing Senator O'Sullivan to take note of the answers that were given and the questions were about quarantine. Uh, thank you, and I, I won't disagree with your ruling, uh, Madam Deputy okay. President. Uh, the, the reality is that quarantine uh, centres become less relevant as, as vaccinations go up. Uh, there are, we are knowing, we do know that we have, uh, uh, you know, with, with the Omicron variant, uh, there, there's a new challenge here, looking, looking okay so far. But uh, the reality is the best thing that Australians can do uh, the best things that uh, uh, travellers can do is to go and uh, get vaccinated, because that is the best way that we can prevent the spread of disease. And uh, sure, uh, quarantine facilities uh, are a part of that, uh, but let's hope that we don't actually require them going into the future, uh, because we have such high levels of vaccinations. As we do here in Australia, we have one of the highest vaccination rates, and that is a credit to all Australians, including uh, this government, who has uh, procured the vaccines and helped establish that across Thank the country. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, Deputy President. Look, um, I, I know Senator O'Sullivan um, was trying his best, I guess, to defend the government's uh, appalling record on uh, when it comes to building quarantine facilities. But I, I can assure the Senate that in my home state in Victoria, where we are already starting to build one facility, um, thanks to thanks to the state government, thanks to the gov state government there applying a lot of pressure on the feds to cough up some of the costs towards the $250 million facility, but it wasn't because the coalition federal government decided one day that they were going to build quarantine facilities around the country. It was led by not just Victoria, by Queensland, Western Australia and even the Northern Territory government, demanding that the Commonwealth take responsibility for what it should be 
ensuring that every Australian, when they come to this country, and non-citizen, go through some form of quarantine. Now, that was the debate that we had 12 months ago. Now, as things have developed, I know Queensland, Victoria and WA are all very keen. And in Victoria, my home state, Victoria, we are continuing to build the quarantine facility at Micklem, right next to uh, our airport in Tullamarine. But a government needs to ensure, like this government, it has a responsibility that it ensures that it does everything it can to avoid any further outbreaks of this deadly disease. And a responsible government, Madam Deputy President, will be doing everything it can to mitigate the risks from future pandemics. And in, in ensuring that you mitigate those risks, building quarantine facilities is just one of many things that this government should be doing, one of many. But we know that this government, the Morrison-Joyce coalition government, is allergic to responsibility. And as I mentioned earlier, quarantine is a Commonwealth responsibility under the federal constitution. So why hasn't the coalition built dedicated quarantine facilities? Why is it being led by the various state and territory governments around the nation? What we do know, almost two years into this pandemic, what we do know is that hotels aren't built for quarantine, and that is why we need quarantine facilities. The Morrison-Joyce government has to build purpose, fit-for-purpose quarantine facilities right around the country, not just picking and choosing states or territories, but there needs to be a national plan. And that's what Labor, federal Labor, under the leadership of Anthony Albanese, has been calling on Mr Morrison and his government to do for some time now. Labor has a plan. This government's failure on quarantine is also shown, as we've heard from other speakers, with the slow vaccine rollout, which I won't go into great detail, Deputy President. But it has done a terrible job. And that is the point that Labor senators have been making today, that this government has done a terrible job, not just on the rollout of the vaccine, but also building quarantine facilities over the last 18 months. So how much more do Australians have to suffer under this government? How much more do they have to wait for this government to finally get on and do its job? How many more lessons do they need to learn from all their mistakes? How many more outbreaks do we need to ensure that this government finally understands that we need an adequate national quarantine system? Now, this new Omicron variant is a reminder of the pandemic, and it's a reminder that this pandemic is still real. Despite a number of the restrictions being lifted right around the country, it does threaten our country, it threatens our economy, because it threatens the working lives of men and women people right around this country. And for us to future-proof our economy, Madam Deputy President, it is important that we start to build these facilities everywhere. There are thousands of jobs to construct these facilities, thousands of jobs supporting local communities. But the Morrison government fails to listen to what the opposition has put forward in terms of its credible plan to protect Australia now and into, into Thank you, the Senator future. Senator Ciccone, your time has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Ayres to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given, to, given by Senator Birmingham in response to questions asked by uh, Senator Waters in relation to the Jenkins review, which of course we know was handed down uh, and tabled today. A very important report that includes 28 thorough recommendations. And it's disappointing to see already that the government is stalling on uh, taking swift action to implement these recommendations. We don't need any more talk here. We know what the problem is. A lot of work has gone into this. A lot of suffering has occurred in order uh, to, for people to come forward and to tell their stories. 
And now what we need is the government to work with all sides to get it done. We need a commitment from the Prime Minister this week that he will work to implement every single one of these recommendations. That's what the Greens want to see. That's what survivors and victim survivors, both in this place and those who have already left, want as well. And I just want to say very clearly just how grateful as a woman in this place I am to the bravery of so many women, many of them staff but other members of parliament, who participated in this process, told their stories, were brave and sacrificed a whole lot of suffering and pain and trauma in order to help improve the workplace conditions in parliament. And of course, the reason that this is important is not because parliament is a place that needs should be better than anywhere else in and of itself. It is because the standards that we set for ourselves are standards that should be set for the rest of the country. If we can't have a safe workplace for women in Australia's parliament, how on earth can we ex expect a safe workplace for women and girls and Australians in every other workplace? And while I um, stand here reflecting on these recommendations and urging the government to act, not defer, on these recommendations, I think it's important that we acknowledge the specific contribution that was made by uh, Brittany Higgins in calling out the treatment that she suffered as a staff member in this building. And I know that there'll be lots of people digesting these recommendations, watching the news tonight, listening to how parliamentarians respond to this. Some who I know Senator Birmingham mentioned already today, we will never know the names of, but were brave enough to come forward and tell their stories. And I thank them, and we all should be thanking them because it is their bravery. Uh, that has pulled this forward. But it will be in vain unless this government acts and commits itself to implementing every single one of these recommendations this week. Give that commitment this week from the Prime Minister. And it was only within a matter of hours that this question asked by Senator Waters to Senator Birmingham uh, during question time, only a matter of hours after the tabling uh, of this report, in question time, where we had another female member on her feet asking Senator Lambie, asking questions of the government, and we had growling and dog sounds coming from the government side of the chamber. Now, one of the key reflections in this report is that parliamentarians have to behave better. We have to take accountability for our own actions and clean up behaviour across the board. Culture starts at the top. And if we expect staff to feel safe and behave respectfully towards each others, to, uh, towards each other, then MPs and senators have to do the same. And I was appalled that only after a matter of hours of the Prime Minister on his feet, growling was coming from his side of the chamber. It's a disgrace. The question is that the answer from Senator Birmingham to uh, Senator Hanson Young be taken note of. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no, the ayes have it. Are there any notes?